When I was young, my mum and dad said, what do you want to do? And I wanted to be a zookeeper. <laughs> I think right from the start, I just like getting outdoors. We're about to get a cat to attack us. This is Coco, Coco Chanel. My poor wife, my wife vaguely got me to yoga. She thought it might calm me down. So I'm doing my yoga trainer's exams next year. So my poor, so it's like, for God's sake, this was meant to calm you down. <laughs> so he rang me up. And again, probably looking back with staggering naivety, he said, come and, come and run this man equipment brand for me. And I said, yeah, all right, I can do that. I had no fucking idea. You know, how do you run the brand? You know, I think any success is a mix of a lot of different things. Go on, Coco. Don't forget, you're so much more than just vlogging shit. <laughs> Welcome to Sports and Outdoor Mentors. In this episode, I chat to Andrew Denton, the CEO of the Outdoor Industries Association. Andrew has spent almost 40 years working in the sports and outdoor industry for brands like Rohan, Ron Hill, and Mountain Equipment as an employee, a leader, and ultimately an owner. We chat about his early career in sales, owning and selling mountain equipment, and his obsessive nature, plus much, much more. But before we get into this episode, I have one favor to ask. Please hit the subscribe button. This helps us to continue grow the channel, elevate the content, and bring you more insights from other amazing leaders from the sports and outdoor industry. Thanks for your support and enjoy the episode. Andrew. Hi, Dan. So 40 years experience almost in the outdoor industry. Indeed. What, looking back even beyond that professional experience, what do you think it is that made you end up in the outdoor industry? When I was young, my mum and dad said, what do you want to do? And I wanted to be a zookeeper. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think right from the start, I just like getting outdoors, climbing up trees or rocks, no, nothing hardcore. My parents were like ramblers. We didn't do anything hardcore, but I kind of, I just like the outdoors. I like plants and animals and blah, blah, blah. And parents completely refused to let me do that. I ended up forcing me to do maths, physics and chemistry A-levels because they would make a real job. And uh, then and relented and uh, I ended up, so we're going too far, but I ended up doing environmental science at university because it was about the closest I could get to doing a degree in animals. <laughs> and, and it all started there. So I think the, the passion, I think just literally just being in woods, just uh, throwing poo sticks under bridges, daft stuff like that. Anything but hardcore outdoors. Okay, interesting, interesting. And... Um you see, you mentioned there that you studied um, environmental sciences and you studied that at the uh, University of Sunderland, mm. I believe, and had a, got a honours degree from, the, uh, from there. When you look back at that time, is there anything actually in your career that you've kind of used what you learned at that point or has it been completely disconnected? Yeah. Um, I think there's been, a, there's been a chain of connection. There's been a theme if you like. And so this was 19, uh, for your viewers, quite how ancient I am, this was 1981, I, uh, I went so uh, doing A-levels in the late 70s. And um, there were two environmental science courses in the whole of the UK, Plymouth and Sunderland, Newcastle way. And uh, so it was really, really unknown. Whereas these days, there's probably hundreds of them. Everyone's talking, you know, we just finished COP. Um, everyone's talking the environment and climate crisis. So, I think um, that theme of an interest in the environment perhaps spreads from 40 years ago to to the speech I was giving in Europe last week or will give next year at the OAA conference about climate crisis and, uh, and how the environment is impacting everything outdoors. So there's certainly been a theme. The, uh, the first job, the thing I actually did with it initially for three years was to teach ecology and environment and outdoor at a, at a residential field study center. Um, so uh, there's not been an abrupt change. There's been a gentle segue. So I didn't end up being a forester or an environmental science officer or a rat catcher, they used to call them. Um, but there's, there's always been a connection from the environment to teaching the environment, to teaching the outdoors, to loving the environment. And if, as we always say, when the climate work we're doing these days, people that love the outdoors make the best stewards. So there's certainly been a connection through all the way through. But I certainly haven't. My, my thesis, my dissertation was um, population dynamics of, uh, of herring gulls, urban seagulls. And so I've never ringed a seagull in anger since. <laughs> And then I believe your first uh, entry point, and please correct me if it's not, was actually you started doing some sales at Rohan. Uh, so 
how did you get from that environmental size to yeah, sales yeah. in Rohan? Yeah, yeah, I was working at this um, field study center, an outdoor center, um, teaching a variety of ecology, environmental science, but also <clears throat> of the, I, I used to work about 35, 40 weeks of the year in the summer holidays, I, I go off climbing, um, and which was great for me. Um, re, climbing on the on the anyway, maybe you'll ask me that later. But climbing on the, on the ridiculous cheap because I had absolutely no money, um, but a lot of fun. And so some of the weeks we were just teaching middle school environmental science, but other times we were taking people canoeing, archery, um, climbing, um, dry ski slope, flat water paddling. Um, and I started getting more and more into indoor stuff. And I, and I had a I got into climbing at uni anyway. And we needed trousers with quick drying and easy and hard wearing and zip pockets to work there and at the time 40 years ago Rohan was sort of a you know it's not not that it's an uncool brand now but now it's perhaps a more of a travel brand then it was a, a pretty hard outdoor brand so I managed to get us a trade deal for all the staff on on Rohan stuff and this is in the days anyone that's that's watching this that's heard of Rohan it was owned or founded by a, a couple called Paul and Sarah Howcroft, who in their day were, were staggeringly innovative. You know, first use of synthetic fabrics, first use of stretch fabrics, first you're talking about fast drying next to skin, you know, when everyone was really talking cotton and ventile pre-Gore. They were the first people to bring Gore-Tex into the UK. So Rowan was a very, very innovative, driven outdoor brand. And so it was it was really useful stuff for staff uniform. And, and consequently, I ended up going up to Yorkshire, where they were based at the time, and got into a great relationship with those guys buying kit from them ended up doing my first mountain marathon with their general manager um, right back in 82 83 and so consequently when they moved to Milton Keynes which they are now based their head office or it was until the recent acquisition I think they they phoned me up and said right we're moving to Milton Keynes we're going to get this big shop it's much bigger than we ever got before we want to do other stuff there we want to do a travel center in there and advice and and make it more of a retail experience which is amazing now, if you think 40 years ago, we're only now talking about retail experiences. So again, Paul and Sarah are really ahead of the curve there. Do you want, do you want to come and run it for us? Do you want to do something? And I, you know, it felt like being at the outdoor three years, so it just felt like a, an interesting change. And I was literally only there three months, six months, and uh, they said, um, Oh, we, we want to get into America. Do you fancy moving to America and opening up America for us? So it was a, it was a very dynamic role within Rohan. Um, but yeah, the very first thing was uh, was cleaning the windows in the Rohan shop in Milton Keynes with uh, with Giles and Sharon. So there were the three of us, and I believe Sharon still works there forty years later. So, and um, we used to uh, we used to sing songs from Greece, and uh, because it was incredibly quiet, because all the Rohan customers were used to buying it mail order. So we had this massive shop, and we were sat there in Milton Keynes, and no one knew we were there, and uh, and we were just sort of uh, sitting there, thrumming our fingers on the table, waiting to see what would happen. So we would sing songs and clean the windows. But it was a great start to the industry, and that so and that took you to the US. Mm. You were saying, uh, wow! So that was a, so. How old were you when you when you moved to the US? I guess uh, graduated at twenty one, three years in the outdoor centre. So probably joined Rowan at twenty four, and pretty much straight to to Canada. So based in Vancouver for them. Um, and then the territory that we tried to open up was um, Vancouver across to Calgary, a Calgary, which is a Glacier National Park area, then down to Denver, and then back across to sort of uh, San Francisco. So the top northwest quarter where you've got, you know, you've got Wyoming and um, Colorado, you, it's a little bit overlapping to Utah. Um, obviously, you've got the, the whole of the sort of the Calgary, Banff, Lake Louise, you know, Vancouver ski area on the northwest. Arcteryx based up in Vancouver in that area. It's a, you've got Oregon, the Northwest Peninsula, Washington, Seattle. It's a very outdoory part of the states. Um, and, they, and they figured, you know, we can only start somewhere such big. But, but interestingly, looking back now how people take on America we, we went across I bought a second hand van I had a bunch of samples that I took on, on excess luggage and, and me <laughs> we had a couple of people in the office based in Vancouver expats but I was the only salesperson Put them all in the back of the van and, and just set off driving around the area and, uh, and literally this is um pre-mobile phones we used to fax things to each other um pre-internet obviously and uh, so i turn up in um in a calgary or bamf or you know boulder um and you go to a phone book and you'd look outdoor shops and climbing shops and you walk in and you knock on the door and say i've got some samples of british outdoor brand would you come would you let me come in and uh, and it was just literally that you would just get the rail out and show them the staff try and take some orders so it was a real seat of the pants, um, very, very, but great fun. And 
you know, I don't know what I learned there, but certainly persistence and certainly just being prepared to uh, to go in and probably naivety, frankly, I have no idea what, how it should be done. So we just kind of learned on the on the road. There was a, a woman that looked after the office um, who was kind of the general manager, Cheryl, um, who was a fantastic mentor to me. And she was an ex IBM saleswoman of the year, very driven. And um, she, you know, really learned a lot from her and kind of, we just made it work bizarrely and it, it did all right we shot our own little mini catalog up there so i'm modeling in the catalog i was on the road flogging the stuff and i we had no money so i slept in this van we had this old panel van with a with a mattress at the bottom and um i slept in the van and used to get out in the mornings and i remember once in boulder colorado um showering in the sprinklers in the park in boulder so i was standing in this park in a pair of shorts <laughs> i going in, going in a wash and, and with hindsight you look back and you know probably lads now doing it would be on expenses and staying in motels and driving in a company hire car i was in this cabby panel van full of samples sleeping in the back of it showering in the village but then then climbing so i i, I do as much good but all the places I was going to were climbing centers. So I finished in Boulder and then get in the car and go to El Dorado Canyon and climb for three days and then get and try and flog some more and then go and see Gary Neptune's, you know, the classic store there or over to Seattle Swallow's Nest or up to see Mike in Calgary um, at the White Shea shop. So, you know, these were, these were the days when the amount of equipment co were there. There were a few REI was there, but there were a lot of quality independents still run by enthusiasts and they were climbers. So you turn up and you, you flog your stuff and then you say, uh, well, where should I go climb? And they'd say, oh, well, come out with the staff. We're all going down to the crank this evening. So, you know, you just go out and flog my day, climb in the evening, have a couple of bug risers and then go to bed in the back of my van and do it all again the next day. Wow. Well, amazing experience. Though, yeah. It sounds yeah. Like. For a youngster. Yeah. We're about to get a cat to attack us. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Hello, Coco. This is Coco, Coco Chanel. You mentioned the word there, persistence. And when I did my research and looking at everything you've done, that, that word or that mindset or spirit seems to be something that's been you know really important for you or or let's say almost key to to your career overall is that something that you recognize looking back now i think any success is a mix of a lot of different things go on coco oh and um but persistence is a huge part of that. I don't think you can expect anything worth getting in the end uh, to come that easily. It's 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 valuable to work for these. I, and whether it's, I'm just thinking. I don't know. But uh, in my my sort of sports interests are endurance based. Whether it's big North Face Alpine routes or Ironman or ultras, I've never been very quick or a talented at anything but i can dig in and 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 give it some and and even when the complete shits hit the fan and you really are knackered and you know you, you you are not in for 16 hours i'm somehow able to just kind of shake it off and, and crack on again so i think and and in the persistence i've made some um, and some awful mistakes and, and had some very challenging times in business and um and it's it's not going to get better by giving up so so i think i always remember i was doing a a seminar years ago, there was a, a chap and he was talking about the value of persistence and he used examples and a few, a couple of the ones he used, one of them was um, Sylvester Stallone, who blesses cotton socks, a lot of the most talented athlete in the world, uh, filmmaker in the world, but um, he had this idea for this boxing movie um, and he was schlepping it around the studios and no one wanted to do it and he finally found someone who wanted to do it, but he said, I want another thing though, but I've got to star in it and they weren't having it, so he schlepped it around another side of studios and finally he found someone that would let him star in it he said on oh, and my dog bud kiss has got to be in it as well and he and he had this vision and he was absolutely certain what it was going to look like at the end and he just refused to give up until he ended up with someone that said all right we'll do it and i know whatever you think of rocky 16 wherever they're at now that original rocky is quite a good movie you know and it's certainly authentic and raw and and, and right down in the streets of baltimore and that that concept and and that that stuck with me. And then the other one was the uh, was the original Colonel Sanders, who apparently went to over five hundred restaurants before he sold his secret recipe. And he used lots of examples like this. But it, it stuck with me that, you know, it what's um, 
uh, you know, these people that say, uh, I, I rather like the acronym, you know, luck, you know, oh, you've been lucky. And it's uh, labor under correct knowledge. It's like, actually, you know, it, it's not usually luck. You know, I, I, I'm a great believer in good fortune, but not in luck. You just, in my mind, I think persistence and hard work absolutely does play its part. So uh, I've never really been shy of trying to keep going <laughs> yeah well and i think you, well to your point you, you make your own luck mm. i uh mm. I, I completely agree i think it's it's critical and something that seems to be a little bit almost out of fashion at the moment it feels like that there's there's always um maybe sometimes there is quicker more efficient ways of doing things but at the end of the day that kind of hard work determination is uh I think it's yeah. critical. Yeah, I think it's, you know, as you say, and, and one doesn't want to, you know, despite being ancient, one doesn't want to appear ancient or out of touch. And near tonic, the, uh, the maintenance of childlike characteristics, the concept of always learning. I, I love that. I'm always, I'm still learning new things now and I want to continue learning until I'm 100. Um, but I do believe that persistence and the ability to not say no and to try something and if it doesn't work try something else and if that doesn't work try something else and to be adaptable and nimble agile with an absolute certainty and clarity about how it will end for you um is is certainly a characteristic that we can all benefit from in some way maybe through a hat and maybe the cleaner ways simpler ways and, and that in itself is a talent of course but to find those ways even if you're fortunate enough to stumble on a quick hat one time there'll be a time when persistence or hard work will pay off and will be useful and i think the personally i i, I don't take any pleasure and i wouldn't encourage anyone to to revel in the persistence and, and dig into that martyrish, oh, look at me, I'm doing 90 hour weeks and aren't I hard? Because, you know, you can just, you can work really hard badly. <laughs> it's absolutely about excellence. It's about labor under technology. It's about working hard in a manner that's progressing to a, a noble, sustainable, responsible goal that, you, that you've got. And so it isn't the work for the work's sake, but I think in my mind, if you finish a huge route or a big race or a, or a, a business deal and you're absolutely exhausted and you've given absolutely everything to it, then um, there's a there's an element of of it was worth fighting for in the end. That, that's kind of cool. And then I think when, you know, when I look at your career in the industry, so you moved from Rohan, I think, maybe to MacPack next or was sort of. Yeah, a bit of transience in there. So um into the, the annals of history here. So uh, the uh, I was with Rohan and um, I was kind of you know repping in the UK. So after after the states, I came back and I was their trade sales manager. So Rohan historically would sell direct, um, and those were the days when selling direct was just verboten. Nobody else did it. Um, so nobody would stock their product in in outdoor stores particularly, and um, they had their own catalog and their own stores, Milton Keynes and uh, a couple of others, um, Long Preston. And um, they brought me back from America and I'd been quite successful in, in not taking no for an answer, driving around the States and Canada. And they said, well, let's let's try it in the UK. You know, people are now asking for Rohan that, that don't live near Milton Keynes or Long Preston. This is pre-internet. Um, you know, so you used to get a postal catalogue and fill out an order form and send it back. So, you know, whilst they did on and they did mail order it wasn't very easy um and so uh again i kind of and i didn't know so I, the first thing i did was pick up the phone and i had a look and i thought oh well the people that seem to sell most stuff are a company called field and trek at the time owned by somebody that that's became a friend afterwards uh, some of your viewers might remember ian gundall and mary and ian gundall whose son richard gundall ended up taking the business that, that i went into business with and something else later um so i rang these people up I had no idea. The naivety is just staggering with that hindsight. And they said, oh, hi, I'm from Rohan. I wonder if you wanted to buy some kit. And Ian Gunnar said, come and talk to me, my boy. So I, I went down to a Brentwood, Essex, I think it was. And um, they, they preceded the entire sort of field and track team. A guy called Chris Harding, who went on to work with Rab later. A guy called Hamish Dunn, who's still the brand director at Mountain Equipment. Um, Ian Gundall, his, his sons were too young then. They were both still at school, Sean and Richard. Um, 
And they sat there and belated me and, and, and beat me up about how selling direct was appalling and blah, 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 blah. And I just sat there. I had no idea about the history and D to C and blah, 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 the difference team. And at the end of it, I goes, yeah, but do you want to buy some of these zipper trousers? You know, they were like, actually, we probably do because people do want them. <laughs> so uh, we opened the Field & Trek account. We got Rohan in the Field & Trek catalog. So it was a paper catalog, like the Little Wizardus catalogs. Um, in those days, he had three. He had the Cotswold catalog, the Field & Trek catalog, and the Taunton catalog. And, and it, it will be hard for many of the viewers to have any idea what it's like without being able to have a buy now button on Amazon. But the, the only way you could get stuff if it wasn't in the store or they had a size of colour you didn't want was by the mail order paper catalogue. And so that was the beginning of, of building the, the trade business for Rohan. Anyway, consequently, I was schlepping around the country. So I covered the entire country. So Penrose, outdoors in Truro, um, up to uh you know, you've got a, a pause yeah yeah we'll just well actually no carry on okay carry on. let's see if it works um penrose outdoors in truro um down to uh, marshalls of aberdeen and uh, clive rowlands of inverness so the entire country um in a tiny little citron car actually i originally had a nice citron but i crashed it in the lake district <laughs> so then i had a really crappy little citron and um bag of samples again and uh, it appeared to be a perfectly reasonable idea that one person could cover the entire country. So I was out for weeks at a time with my border collie called Kim, which is standing for the Caramore International Mountain Marathon, currently called the OM. But this is the mountain. So I was doing a lot of fell running and mountain running at the moment with this dog. And so uh, I would just be on the, on, on the road for weeks and weeks and weeks. So I kind of knew a lot of people. And consequently, um, you, you mentioned what came after Rohan. After I'd been doing that with the whole Rohan thing experience for about three years, um, I was a, friends with a, a couple, a guy called Ian Gibson, who's ex-Alpine Sports, ex Snow and Rock, and a woman called Caroline Croft, who had started a small brand called Calange. Um, so the founders were Caroline Croft and Angela Elliott Walker. Angela Elliott Walker went to found and start the Low Alpine clothing range. So Low Alpine used to be the most popular clothing brand in the UK. Uh, now they obviously only make packs. Um, but in those days, they had, a, they had their own waterproof called Triple Point Ceramic. And they had the first people to do nice fleece, heathered fleece, good looking fleece, non-technical fleece. Um, which people won't believe that there was a day when you, the only one brand did that, but they were the first people that did really nice looking casual fleeces. And so Angela and, and Cal started Cal Ange. Um, Angela left to do the low. Uh, Ian came in from Snow and Rock. And, uh, you know, I was having dinner with them one day up in Manchester and they said, um, you know, do you fancy coming in? Um, tiny business. So I came in as a shareholder and director, you know, got out of Rohan 25, 26, whatever it would be. Um, and became a shareholder and a director and an owner of this little business, Kalange. Um, and, and found that, I, um, so I, I flogged it all in the north, Ian flogged it all in the south, the cat again, so I'm sorry, it will go out. So the cat never ever comes in, and it obviously, <laughs> um, so, um, but on the top of that, Ian did all the warehousing and the operations, and I found I had a bit of a flair, I think, for uh, product and marketing. So I got really involved on in the technical design side with Cal, and we made some really quite cool, unusual products. We had, we had a great fan in Dick Turnbull in Outside, um, who liked some of our stuff, and uh, we got great reviews. Um, so we started to build that brand quite successfully, but it was hard, hard work. There's three of us, plus a seams mistress and an office manager, all done on the back of mortgages. Um, you know, we, there were weeks where we had to turn the lights off. We had no power, we couldn't pay ourselves on some months, but we built the brand, but it was tough. And we had an opportunity. We were climbing in New Zealand and the Mac Pack brand hadn't come out of Australasia, Australia, New Zealand, and we're looking to come into Europe. So we had an opportunity to become the first distributor in Europe for MacPack, Mick Pick, um, as with the New Zealand vowels. And so uh, we took that opportunity and um, perhaps again back to this theme of persistence. No one wanted it. Everyone was buying caramel packs. Caramel and Burgas were the number one and number two pack in the UK. And then there was this new fangled American brand coming in um, who'd got some offices up um, in Glasgow. Um, what was Bob? Somebody brought in some new fangled brand from uh, no one had heard called The North Face. And uh, so they were just kind of tweaking it. And so, and there was no one was doing Deuter or Fjall Raven or anything like that, really. It was primarily just Burgas and Caramel. And so we uh, 
no one wanted to buy them, but we went around all our stores. We took samples in. We lent. We did. We were the first people to do something called loan stocks. So the first people to just say, "Hey, take this, climb with it for a couple of weeks, and let us know what you think." And it kind of helped that we would go out climbing as well with them. This this was the times when most people in the were just pure enthusiasts. You know, no background other than outdoors. So it helped if you you go into the shop staff, you you'd show them the product. And when, when everyone clocked off, you say, well, let's go climbing, let's try it and take it out on the hill. So we, we infiltrated via staff. And I remember the buyer at Cotswold at the time was a guy called Peter Cole, um, who became a bit of a legend in the industry himself. And Peter, uh, Peter finally phoned me up and said, you know, you've, you've completely brainwashed all our staff. They all keep asking me for map packs, so come and see me. And so we kind of reversed our way back into Cotswold, Field and Track, et cetera, with map pack. And so we ended up growing the map pack distribution business to be as big or bigger than our own Calange own brand. So for three years, we had uh, the brand that we owned, Calange, which made um, funky rock climbing, so pink tights and bright patterned fleeces for Mick Lovett and and um, Ron Fawcett and um, Johnny Dawes and all this sort of young climbers in the 80s. Um, not John Dunn, but we'll come back to John Dunn in, in another time. But a lot of that uh, did a lot of work with um, with the climbers in the 80s and the 90s and uh, and Matt Peck as well. So did that for three years and yeah, it was quite successful. After Matt Peck, I think yeah. then you moved into uh, Mountain Equipment and Ron Hill, which was a uh, let's say quite a bigger biggest yeah, yeah, part yeah. of your yeah, career yeah. so i'd love to love to hear more about that how that developed and and obviously in the end you exited from the brand so yeah really interested to know that some of the challenges and successes and failures of that period that's, that's a humongous question uh, i'll start with the transition or how 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 on earth it, it happened um so so we were running Calange Map Pack, going well, enjoying it. Um, super seated the pants, entrepreneurial stuff, as I say, but it was growing. And so sort of we got to seven figures from nothing, which is always tough. That first million, I think, is a is a hard point to break through. Um, and you know, this was in the late eighties, early nineties, so you know, it was probably worth more then than it is now a million <laughs> of sales. Um, again, pre, pre, yeah, pre, pre internet. Certain, certainly, we, I, I remember seeing my first fax in Ron in uh, in Rohan, um, and we were faxing everything still in Calange, but we were just starting email, just starting the internet around that late eighties, early nineties in business. Then maybe we were behind the times compared to Silicon Valley, but it was around then. So yeah, it was a uh, it was great fun. But we built it up, and we were uh, rung up by a company called Pico, which uh, it transpires was short for Peacock Company, um, uh, founded by two boys called Matthew and Michael Peacock, with an interest to acquire the Calange brand. It, it, it transpired because we'd been uh, talking to, they had a retail arm and they loved our catalogue and our photographs. We had this, we, our catalogue punched above its weight. Um, mainly because I copied the Patagonia catalogue, which was iconic at the time. And uh, we used a similar style and flavour, but with a very irreverent tone. And we used to hide dread dreadful expressions in the copy, knowing that no one would ring them and, and wonder if anyone would ring them. So uh, we would, uh, I remember once we had um, uh, the, one of our fleeces, the active fleece, perfect for work and foreplay and we managed to get the uh, foreplay together and nobody actually remembered uh, to actually you know what's that extra e in the middle should that just be working for play but uh, we had a number of little sillies like that so it was a very irreverent thing and uh, we had a uh, the, the main photographer for patagonia was rick ridgeway so ours uh, we took all around photos couldn't afford a photographer but he was called dick dirigible as opposed to rick ridgeway so um lots of silly stuff <laughs> anyway it caught the attention of the guys at, um, at pico group and they had got into the industry. They purchased Ron Hill, the Ron Hill brand, which had gone into receivership in the 1990s, something like that. Um, two city guys, good funding, um, both ex-merchant bankers, both sportsmen in their early mid-20s. And uh, they contacted Calange because they loved the catalogue and they just thought we were miles bigger than we were. They just saw this catalogue, thought, oh, well, this is amazing. You know, we've got a sports brand. We need an outdoor brand. Let's go like this. And uh, when they sort of realised that we were only a million and half of that was sort of uh, somebody else's brand with MacPack, it was like they were a bit less interested. Um, but we were growing really strongly. And um, I, I was struggling. I felt that the opportunity we had 
with what we could do with our product and our marketing was greater than our cash flow would allow. It was just challenging. And um, so I was quite interested in the sale to be nestled within a, a larger company and my two partners weren't. And so it was absolutely fine. We didn't fall out, you know, and I would still, great to see Carolyn and Ian again, but um, they they decided they didn't weren't interested in that. So we didn't pursue that. Um, and a month or two later, out the blue, um, Matthew rang me and said, I've just acquired the intellectual property for mountain equipment. Um, the company had gone bust around 91. A lot of people were interested in buying it, but it, it hadn't gone via a sort of a, a traditional disposal acquisition route. Um, and it really got down to a point where there was only really the IP left. There was a bit of stock, um, two members of staff, and people had fought over it. And it was a, an iconic brand started in 1961 by Peter Hutchinson. Peter Hutchinson was still around. Um, but they'd had they'd had pension fund investment and a few other investments. And Peter was always a fabulous, fabulous product guru, but not necessarily the, the most savvy uh, business person. Um, and they'd been mismanaged by, by the pension fund people. So sadly, it hadn't, they hadn't really sold it for a good amount of money. Matthew had really just acquired the IP. Although, although there's, there's rumor that the people were flying in from Reebok USA and, and Matthew managed to sweep it out from under their nose. I, th I think a lot of people would bought it. And if Peter had sold it earlier, it, it could have gone for a lot more. But Matthew picked it up for a bit of a song. Um, but then, then he, I think he literally had no idea what to do. It was the only, he had Ron Hill. Um, they were about to acquire Cotton Oxford, the rugby brand as well. They had nothing outdoor, no idea about outdoor. So he rang me up. And again, probably looking back with staggering naivety, he said, come and, come and run this man equipment brand for me. And I said, yeah, all right, I can do that. So I don't know, fucking idea. You know, how do you run a brand? You know, there I am, 27, whatever it was. He made me managing director or whatever it was, brand director of this brand. And we, but we had nothing. We had one filing cabinet with some out-of-date clients in. Um, we had uh, uh, some sleeping bags left that were stock in a few boxes. Um, the office sales manager, Dean, Dean Wardle, if you're watching this, Dean is still there. Dean, absolute gem for Mountain Equipment, still working there as the customer service director or something. Um, and then the production manager, Morag, Morag Ashworth, who's still a close friend now. And that was it. So we literally started this. We had no Gore license. You needed a license to have Gore products. We had no Polartec license. Um, so we couldn't buy the fabrics that we needed or to be in the premium end. We had no real patterns or designs and stuff. Um, so it was uh, a really quite an exciting opportunity. And, and with hindsight now, you, you just say, how on earth did we do it? Ah, it was just, but again, that I think staggering naivety, not, not realizing how big the problem could be, um, a ridiculous amount of useful confidence, um, persistence, very hard work. We worked enormous hours, but you know, we were no one. I don't friend. None of us were married. We were the, we, the Ron Hill brand. So we, you know, we would we would work in the morning, all run at lunchtime, and and Ron Hill was full of world class runners. You know, Olympians and people. So uh, you'd go out and do a hard session at lunchtime, and then come back and work till late in the evening, then go down. So. There was uh, the foundry and the rope race. There were two couple of climbing walls open at, around that time. So we would go climbing in the evenings um, and, and just work really, really hard and make some dreadful mistakes. We, uh, we, we once made a, a jacket, a Polytech jacket called the, we had two, the Baffin and the Yukon. And uh, it was in a time when, um, what was it, Regatta were doing some, uh, Mountain Equipment had done some shelled fleece jackets, the Fastnet and Finisterre, and they've been hugely successful, but also part of their downfall. And then Regatta had got into that area as well. A lot of people wanted these value for money, so sort of shell fleeces. So we wanted to do a more technical version of it. And I remember there was a, a, a product called the Patagonia Glissade, which was kind of really funky, this reversible fleece line jacket. So we did the Baffin and the Yukon, and we, vastly over forecast thousands thousands too many and and, and one of the uh, the german distributors said uh, we have baffin and yukon to feed to the animals <laughs> it's like basically we have we have more they're worth less than straw um so so we made some dreadful mistakes we ended up clearing the entire lot to rei um which i still got the contents from the old days so we did make some absolute dire mistakes but somehow or other through all the dreadful mistakes we we stumbled on i think I managed to convince W.L. Gore to re-give us a license. 
This was at a time when Phoenix were about to go bust. So Phoenix had racked up this enormous Gore bill. Um, Gore used to just keep selling product fabric to people and not ask for money until they were so far in hock that it was a disaster. So they they'd had this similar challenge with other brands. So it was kind of, kind of was tough times. Um, our rep was a guy called Andy Warrinder, who ended up being the global head of WL Gore. So it was quite funny that I remember when he came in with his samples. Um, he's now retired, but very successful at WL Gore. And anyway, we, we re-got the license. I don't know, cheek bare-faced Tootsburg, I don't know. But anyway, we got the license again. I think they believed in the IP, perhaps the brand, the Mount brand. Uh, it, even the brand, they'd they'd got the iconic M, but they'd mashed it up and put a very bad version of it with, with the Mount Equipment done badly. And they the logo was 20 Everest Expeditions. It was all mashed in there. So we threw that away. We we restarted with the, with the iconic M, and uh, and we used a font called Eagle Bold Extended, and they're still using that today. Now in 2023, at the at the Bolling Group, who now own Mount Equipment. So I remember when we we did that really early on. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? We bought this brand, which is meant to be iconic, and the first thing I did was throw the brand away and redesign it again. The the extraordinary naivety of youth. Um, but I guess the must have I must have had some sort of vision, some sort of clarity that it might be worth doing because they're still using it now 30 years later and so we repositioned that equipment it had gone right downhill it had been chasing price point we repositioned it we got a gore license we got a Polatec license i took um the the, the iconic photograph that mountain Women have used over the years and i saw it at kendall mountain festival this literally 2023 is of andy parkins summit in broad peak He's wearing a full red Gore-Tex shell, a down suit. Um, I think the photo's taken by Pete Boardman. And he's just summiting Broad Peak with the whole of the Himalaya out behind him with a big white sort of um, African dish dash sort of wrapped around his head, just looking hardcore. It's a stunning photograph. And, uh, and, and, and in Kendall, it still looked good this year. But uh, 30 years ago, it was, it was real mountain equipment returning to its roots. You know, mountain equipment was this brand that had done the first British ascent of every 8,000 metre peak, the, both the poles. Um, mountain equipment started in the 60s when there was really only carrying more troll mountain equipment. There were very, very few brands. Berghaus was one of the first brands. It had lost its way and we repositioned it as this iconic brand. Um, and that really began that whole stage. We also owned, we, we, you know, so at that time I went in as, as managing director of Mountain Equipment, but Matthew Peacock, the manager I mentioned, got very bored very quickly. I think he was much used to the pace um, of, of finance down in London, and he was great at buying brands and selling brands, but dreadful at managing and running them, the best one in the world. And he, the first, I'm still in touch with Matthew, he's a wonderful chap. He's been infinitely more successful. He runs um, the Hanover Investment Fund, which has hundreds of millions under investment in London now. Very, very successful. So Matthew uh, got fairly fed up fairly quickly. And um, a, our finance director of the, of the group was a guy called Ian Powell. Um, and by now, I suppose we're a year or two in. I'm doing all this work on Matthew Women, but... I, I obviously found that I had a little bit of a, of a, a talent or a touch for product and marketing particularly and, and perhaps overlapping into relationships and sales. Um, and so by now I was working with the product and marketing team at Ron Hill and the product and marketing team with Cotton Oxford, the rugby brand that we owned um, within the group, um, and the product and marketing team at Arena Swimwear, which we own for the UK. And so, so it was a really, really eclectic, diverse sort of portfolio of brands. Um, so, so one day I'd be designing a, a down suit, and the next day we'd be out with a bunch of runners, and the next day we were up at Murrayfield trying to negotiate the Scottish rugby contract. So. I, I, I can't even begin to think how one juggles that lot these days, but you know, the youth and enthusiasm um, and a blinding un, real, lack of reality, perhaps. So we did kind of manage it, but it was going okay. But Matthew was getting bored. And so Ian Powell, finance director, uh, and myself, who was by then the group product and marketing director, which is, if you think that's staggering, how did I go in two years to be a brand director for one brand to the group product marketing director? But it was probably just because we just had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> it was, in, you've got to remember, there, were, there weren't many sports and outdoor brands around. I mean, you know, Nike was only created a year or two before. So, so it was a very fast growing. You could make a heck of a lot of cock ups and still make money in those days. So um, we, we, I think we made less cock ups than others. That's probably the, the best claim to fame. So we were juggling all these things and Ian, Matthew got fed up and Ian, who was our finance guy, Ian was great on finance and operations. And I appeared to have a, a little bit of a flair for sales products and marketing. 
And so Ian said, I think we can do a management buyout here and, and get this business. I think Matthew would take an offer. He's, he's fed up with it all. So, so we, did, we did a deal, a long and complex deal involving venture capital, et cetera. Um, and it, it meant that we would sell um, the Cotton Oxford rugby brand and the arena distribution and a few other bits and pieces and ended up with quite a clean. So we ended up owning the building and Ron Hill and, and the mountain equipment brand. It was a little bit to in and from with mountain equipment licensing deal. But fundamentally, we ended up having mountain equipment and Ron Hill with Ian and I at the helm owning that business of half each. And that was hugely exciting. Ian, I'm still in business with Ian and other things for 30 years later. Very, very talented accountant, KPMG, very commercial commercially astute uh, and no interest or empathy or, or flair at all for product or marketing or, or sports or outdoors just a brilliant numbers man and I, I was virtually dyslexic on the numbers but really loved the product so so there was a real yin and yang a real fit that like, like any good climbing partnership I trusted him on his end of the rope and he trusted me at my end of the rope and, and so it really worked he didn't do my job I didn't do his job we, we set about running those two brands. We had a great team on both. Um, and early on, we brought in, the, I previously mentioned at the buying director at Field & Trek, a guy called Hamish Dunn to come and run the uh, Mount Equipment brand. Um, and then um, Mike Deegan, who was ex-Ron Hill, had been in the old days with Ron. He came back to help run the Ron Hill brand. And uh, we really set about you know, the next 10 years, you know, really, really developing those brands. You mentioned there the the fact that you had very complementary skills with your partners. Mm. I wonder, have you throughout your career have you gone outside of that kind of group of partners and looked for mentors or coaches to support you and to to guide you? Or yeah, have you have you used those type of resources? Yes, um, possibly not too much in in sort of face to face um you know as one would imagine a traditional sort of mentor or, or coaching um business coaching role but fascinated by the whole idea of and concept of and and the very early 90s when i was trying to again this is you know having got a degree ring in seagulls how what did i know about marketing <laughs> um and and again of course you know marketing was the wild west but this new thing called the internet had just been invented um there was this guy called steve jobs who'd got an alternate computer called apple so we were all on these apples that didn't really work but we kind of liked them and everyone else on microsoft nothing talked to each other so these these are the days you know you you bought full bleed adverts and you printed them in in high magazine or mountain magazine so marketing was something I was kind of trying to understand and learn what influenced people buying things. So I went and did um, a course in something that was in the 90s, 80s and 90s was quite new then called um, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which is fundamentally a, a little bit of a, you know, it's a California based mishmash of, um, of psychology and, and language patterns and influence patterns. But there's some really still some fascinating work in NLP. And, and a lot of the early NLP work has more popularly these days been, been morphed into what's now perhaps known more as coaching and, and the use of, uh, you know, of, of language patterns and influence patterns and, uh, and, and working with people to get the best out of people. So I, I started reading a lot in about NLP, ended up because I'm Whatever I do, I either don't do it at all or I do try to do it quite well. <laughs> and so I do get in. My, uh, my best man at the speech said, in, and the wedding said something about, um, and Andrew believes he's focused, everybody else thinks he's obsessed. But uh, I, I certainly am conscious that I can be quite focused. And so, I, I, so trust me, I thought, right, I need to know about this. So who's the founder of it? Right, I need to go to California, meet this guy. So I ended up doing an NLP practitioner certificate. Then I ended up doing a master's and, a, and ended up doing a trainer's and really understanding. So, so I was absolutely then, I was working directly with um, Rich Bannon and John Grinder, the founders of those language pattern skills, and a number of people in the area on, on influence, why people behave in ways they do how and, and a lot of this work has morphed into uh, cognitive behavior therapy now it comes from a lot of that early work from virginia satir and and, and um the um I've forgotten the other method i'll come back to me um so 
I was really starting to be quite interested in it and to the point that I then even started to get into um, transactional analysis therapy work and, and, and psychology and behavior psychology and why not only do people buy and sell things, but by why we behave in different ways. And so I had quite a number of coaches and then I was just seeking out people in these areas who were excellent, but both to, both people that I thought were genuinely good. I went again to the States and, and then to, to Switzerland to see Stephen Covey that wrote the, the probably the best selling business book of all time, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, and rather than go to a, Co, you know, a Covey disciple British thing. I said, well, I'm going to go and see the real guy, haven't you? And actually so I spent three days with Stephen Covey. Um, I went to see, you know, possibly a little bit more populist, but fascinated to see his communication skills, Anthony Robbins a couple of times and, and how he can hold 3,000 people in the palm of his hand for, for three days. Fascinating drive and charisma. So learning different things from different people. So learning structure from from Bandler, and learning the uh, the the you know what Covey's done is fundamentally dilute loads and loads of mentors and try to understand the common themes and common rules and common goals from those guys. So how did he do that? Why, how do you take a, a complex ecosystem and dilute it down to clear rules that you can follow? How did how did Robbins collect that communication, passion and energy and charisma and, and, and convert it into that raving fans that he's got, that recruitment retention of, of people. So so I always enjoyed most years going to see Zig Ziglar on sales, um, What's the uh, the other uh, Brian? Oh, the other great sales American Brian Tracy. So used to go particularly Americans. There's somehow something about Americans and uh, and sales and marketing and communication side. So I went to. Um, the uh, RADA and did a, 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 a dramatic course on presentation skills and communication. Um, I went to do a, a three day stand up comedy course on uh, which ended up doing an open mic in London, which was desperately challenging way outside my comfort zone, but learning how to entertain, learning how to be on stage, learning how to communicate. Learn. So I have X, I want Y, how do I make that transaction happen? So the transaction analysis side, I, I, that's something that is used in, in relate therapy, but it's also used in corporate transactions and how different departments, how different people, how negotiations take place, business negotiations, transactions. So I really enjoyed digging into the understanding of that process. And to answer your question, to come full circle, the mentors perhaps were both authors and presenters and and even founders of disciplines um, and to, to work directly with them. And I always like to try and go, go to source and understand and then extrapolate back from them. So I, I would say, you know, I mentioned Cheryl, the mentor, the IBM salesperson of the year in Canada. I'd say Matthew Peacock, I learned a lot from in the two years I was with Matthew. Ian, my business partner, learned a huge amount from Ian, who's gone on to be a hugely successful chief exec himself. So always tried to learn with people and from people. And, and of course, you know, team members and, and, and staff right the way through. Um, but I'd say the ones that have really stood out for me perhaps have been the, the international people I've gone to see. Okay. Uh, it's clear that um, outdoor activity sport has been an important part throughout your career. Obviously, something that you're very passionate about, you love doing. But is it also something, you know, at the same time when I listen to you, you know, you're clearly whatever you're doing, you're doing it at 110, maybe 200 percent, depending <laughs> on who you talk to. So you're clearly very, very dedicated. So what role does whether it's running, climbing, whatever, kind of play in helping you maintain that level of intensity? Because I guess maybe when you're younger, it's easier to do that, to maintain it. But the older you get, probably the more difficult that is. So what role does outdoor activities, whatever they may be, play in that, in your ability to do that? I mean, getting back to the, the, the core of that, the first point of that, the intensity of doing something in that, where, you know, I'm, I'm 60 now, 61 soon. Um, and when I was young, you know, no one had even heard of autistic spectrum disorder or Asperger's or anything like that. I, I, I'm a very focused person and a lot of entrepreneurs are and, uh, and I'm, whether there's a spectrum or a scale, who knows. But uh, I've certainly always been very, very focused and driven if I want to do something. And 
and I, I, I still struggle to understand why anyone would want to do something and not do it well. And, 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 and perhaps I'm out of step with that. And that, that's fine. I'm quite happy that I'm, I'm not in the middle of the distribution curve. Um, so, so whatever I do and whether it does drive some people bananas, I don't know. Um, I, I remember once being in a design meeting and, uh, and then poor designer with hindsight, Helen Kilner, I apologize, Helen, if you're watching this, was in tears because I'd sent this thing back again. And I just I was trying to explain. I said, Helen, I'm so, so I'm, I'm the grit that enables you to make the pearl. I just, it's just not right yet. And I'm really sorry, but I know it's better than the Burghaus hood, but it's still not right. I want our hood to be perfect. People, people will laugh. You know, I, I got into coffee and, and you know, it's like bloody Starbucks in the corner over there. And, and when, I, when I, I went down to London, did a three-day barista course on getting the right, perfect coffee. Um, my, my, wife, my wife works in TV and movies and had to do a job on a motorbike. So she got a motorbike license and said, oh, I think you'd like this. And I put it off for ages. But then in the end, I, I, I thought, oh, I'll do that. And then I ended up doing the highest qualification the civilian can ride on a motorbike. And she's like, you're obsessed. What? What's wrong with just riding a motorbike like normal people do? It's like, well, if you're going to do it, you're just going to do it as well as you could possibly do it. And it's just not worth starting. So I, I, I'm shit at a lot of things. But if I do something, I'm usually fairly competent at it or at least try to be. And I think that's so whether that's a fault, I don't know. But it's a drive and it's a, it's it's historic and it's in it's everything. But. But I'm not enormously talented at anything, to be frank. Um, but that drive, so I used to work with those climbers that were brilliant and I would, I would, I tried to climb, but I never got that. I mean, I climbed some pretty decent routes, but it, you know, you're never, got, never as good as your athletes or, you know, I, I used, I got into triathlon. So, okay, if you're going to do triathlon, what's the hardest triathlon in the world? The Ironman. If you're going to do that, then I might as well try and get into the world championships and get into the British team. So I got, so, but I wasn't very talented and I had injuries and challenges. I got into it late. So the goal I set myself was to be within the top hundred in the world in my age group. And I got 91st in the world championships in the, in the Ironmans. And, uh, and that was, that was cool. So I do kind of like, I think that intensity can be tempered by realism. I, I quite like, and it's very tedious um, smart goals. And, and anyone's done any coaching knows it's, you know, coaching level one, but a you know not only a specific measurable and, and attainable goal a realistic goal and so rather than saying i want to win kona i i said i'd like to be 100 in the world and uh, and hit 91st and that was that was good enough you know I, I have to say about two minutes after crossing the finish line i figured out how i could take 15 minutes off my time and get in the top 50 but so i think in answer to your question i think that intensity is in everything i do and wife, we were watching a movie once and the character, character turned to the her spouse and said uh I know I'm not an easy person to love. And I suspect that might be, uh, my wife's probably got a lot of patience. I don't know, you met her last night. But um, she's, she's put up with me and thank you. Um, but I think that intensity is in, is in most things I do, if not everything. And, and perhaps having the release of the outdoor sports, in neighbor, I think it may be everything. If you only did one thing, I'm really eclectic. So I, I, I love running the businesses, but I run the portfolio of businesses. I, I love piano I love doing my sport I love climbing I love skiing I love our animals so perhaps I'm able to mellow that intensity over such a broad being being competent at a number of things I think if I poured all that intensity to one thing it would drive everyone insane including myself so maybe these outdoor sports are the release the the pressure valve Dan perhaps for allowing me because I think I yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very conscious of it right you know I can get really really channeled and if I the poor guys at the OIA now or mountain equipment as it was or, or wherever it must be exhausting working with me so maybe the fact that every now and then I'll switch off from the business and go and you know I, I'm a really keen cyclist uh, and I'm, I've got nine bikes in the garage out there but I love just tinkering with them and getting it exactly right and getting these components to be just right and, and doing all the research to get the best derailleur at the moment so taking that intensity and putting it into all the motorbike thing or, or whatever thing it is I want to be good at perhaps it's a a release so that it doesn't become overwhelmingly intense in in the business. Does that answer the question? Yeah, in a yeah absolutely. Roundabout way. No, no, absolutely. Well, it leads nicely to the next question because 
as you just mentioned, you know, at the moment you're you're the owner of um, several different businesses or involved in the ownership of several different businesses. You're a council member for several different businesses and associations. You're secretary general for It's Great Out There, chairman for Sheffield the Outdoor City, um, part owner and director of the Climbing Centre, obviously CEO of the OAA, which we haven't got to yet. Mm. And I'm sure there's other things that I've not mentioned. You're, uh, you were talking last night about your involvement in the, your daughter's school and the, the group of schools. Mm. As you've mentioned, you're married. Yeah. As I just mentioned, yeah. you have a daughter. So how on earth do you manage to find a balance between all that? And, and the right balance, if there is such a thing as the right balance? Mm. Because I have definitely haven't found it if there is. But. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do, I do love that word balance. We've got a slack line at the bottom of the garden and I'm really into yoga at the moment. So again, again, my poor wife, my wife really got me into yoga. She thought it might calm me down. So I'm doing my yoga trainer's exams next year. So my poor, so it's like, for God's sake, this was meant to calm you down. <laughs> anyway, I'm really into yoga now. Um, so, um, but balance, that's what brought me from yoga, sorry. Um, I, 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 yeah, it's absolutely vital, isn't it? And I think despite the intent, or perhaps because of it, I don't know, when, when Ian and I sort of split and after selling Matthew Quinn or Matthew split, then they, they've they absolutely focused on businesses and running, you know, one or two businesses, making way more money than I have. But I've tried to, I've stayed in the outdoors because I'm passionate about it. I love it. But because it does enable that balance, I think, for me. I've, I've just got back from an expedition to Baffin Island. I was away for nearly a month. I always go away every year on a trip or an expedition. I, I managed to train probably six days a week so I'm, I'm still racing and still fit for for my age group um and i think if i'd gone into a single business with that level of of intensity or drive then i think it would have been yeah i don't know potentially overwhelming for for me i don't know mental fragility in, in doing too much in one area so so i think being able to spread the the business is out over a wide portfolio is enjoyable and being able to spread life out right from the beginning. I've always wanted to stay in, in the outdoors and the environment and that, that balance because because it enables me to spread, I think, the intensity in that way. And so it's so having that balance is, is absolutely essential. And I, and I look back over the career and I think, you know, we sold sold my equipment um business when i was 39 um for you know significant you know if, if one wanted to one could have just retired then um i, I actually i did briefly went to chamonix and did the season there and it's amazing how boring being retired is at 39 or 40 but um so so i've always had to have other things but i'm glad i tried to spread it and balance it and i think i'm quite proud and have the the fact that the the twenty years after selling mad equipment, I've all I've done loads of different things and in this and out that and fabulously enjoyable and exciting, but nothing in in such an amount that it overwhelms. Nothing that in the last twenty years, that not a single week has gone by when I haven't trained or been outdoors or been on my bike. Um, or, or being with my daughter, you know, you, you saw Miss Phil and Dan stay with us last night, you know, I was up this morning playing the piano with my daughter, doing a bit of homework, took her to school. Then if you weren't here, I'd be cracking into some work. I get out on the bike in the afternoon, crack into a bit more work, pick my daughter up. It's, I, I love that mix because I, I won't, if I dropped dead tomorrow, I would just be so grateful for my life. I wouldn't have any regrets at all. I, I'm, I'm planning at the moment, my current intensity is to, to, to get to the Ironman at 100. So I'm really, really working very hard on health span at the moment. I'm really into a longevity and driving health because I've got a nine-year-old daughter and I absolutely want to be a, an active grandfather. So uh, I need to work harder than others on that. So that's my current level of intensity or focus. But um, I think the way you get there for me anyway, is to have that balance that portfolio that you know I, I love my training and my fitness but I'm not doing Ironman anymore I don't have the time for that but that's okay so you know there's a bit of training and there's a bit of, of enjoyment there's a bit of business there's a bit of family and finding that balance where everyone's happy the, I, I think one of the challenges for it perhaps is the capacity and and I perhaps have got a little bit more energy or capacity than, than some or willingness to fit into the 24 times 60 minutes a day. So that perhaps is a, a tiny bit of a juggling skill. 
Um, but it, but I for me never losing touch of what that end point needs to be, which is a contented, happy, enjoyable, successful life that you can be absolutely proud of. And and at, at any point finish and say, that was good. I, and that was, I was pleased about that. I, I, I left nothing out on the table. Yeah. And that's our balance is essential for that. Because it, I, I think if you, if you finish some, some of my business, people say, oh yeah, I, I made millions and millions, but, but gosh, you know, my, I'm, I'm, got diabetes now and I, I can barely pick up my grandchildren and I'm just knackered or all the sports people that that have got no pension because they did nothing else or it's for me I, they if I got too intense into any one area it would unbalance everything and then there would might be regrets so it's so to try to what's it the rising tide lifts all boats you know to try and keep that balance is is sense such that at any one point everything you're doing everything well enough and if you're not doing it, then you don't care about it. It doesn't matter. So we touched briefly on the OIA, um, so the Outdoor Industry Association for the UK, that obviously you're CEO and have been now for oh, 12 years. I was going to say yeah, over yeah, 10 yeah. years, yeah. yeah um, <laughs> it was meant to be three months. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's a good place to start. So, so why is it? now 12 years what is it that keeps you wanting to yeah, to do yeah, that yeah yeah i was i was sat next to mark held in the airport that is supposed today marks the secretary general of the european or the first secretary general of the european outdoor group and he's just retired and he said, he said Andrew, i never thought you'd last this long i said like, neither did i mark neither did i so um so yeah go back in time 12 years then and um i'd uh, i just finished a, a contract with um the wonderful williams family at arc who had bought the om brand the original mountain marathon they um they had it was the kim the caramel international marathon um, mike ashley bought caramel um ian and i failed to buy caramel so we were briefly in the loop of trying to buy caramel with uh, with stephen cannon a project there but um mike ashley bought caramel didn't want or need the Kim brand or the event. So the Williams family um, managed to get hold of it and I helped with that process. And then for a couple of years, I was the race director and did the transition and, and did some work with those guys at, at OM, which is a, a, a fabulous uh, two day mountain marathon event, I, which I I've also, I love running it as well. So I did the first OM in 1984 and I did the my 25th mountain marathon this year, a couple of weeks ago in Snedonia, which was nice. And what was funny is that I was I was knackered and uh, and barely finished it in 1984, and I was knackered and barely finished it now, and and in the middle I kind of did okay in the elite section, but uh, I thought well at 60 to be roughly the same as at 21, it's probably not far off. So it was okay. I enjoyed it. I love it. It's great to get out. But anyway, um, so I just finished that contract, um, and I had a bit of space, and somebody rang me up and said, "Have you seen this advert? Looking for a part-time chief exec of." the Outdoor Industry Association, which had just changed its branding from the Camping and Outdoor Leisure Association, COLA. And it had historically been this trade organization that, that ran a big trade show in Harrogate called the COLA Trade Show. And I, I think as much as anything, I was a bit bored. I don't, I don't do boredom very well. So, um, I, um, so I've got a big poster upstairs in my room saying getting bored is not allowed. So uh, I, yeah. Uh, it's just if you look at my diary almost there are an absolute minimum of 365 entries there is never a day where there's not something in it and if if it's a if there is a free day then i'll put in a three-hour bike ride or something so i'm i'm terrible at getting bored i have a probably almost a phobia of it so i was thinking oh god what am i gonna do we've just done this on deal that's kind of blending down the climbing wall's trogging along john's running that we must talk about the climbing wall but um you know, oof, you know, this looks interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll find out a bit more about it. And I, I dug in and thought, oh, it looks interesting. I'll, I'll go along for the interview because I knew the people on the interview panel. So it was Corey Taylor, um, who's the owner of Branchwood Taylor, who's you know, become a great friend, who was the chair at the time. Anthony Griesby, the owner of Countryside Skiing Climb, which is another great friend of mine now. Um, and um, then somebody, uh, Matt um, Eastman from the Camping and Caravan Association, which I now do a lot of work with the, and the guys there. So I thought, oh, well, I'll go along to the interview and find out what it's all about. And uh, went along and um, it was for this two, three day a week part-time chief exec. And uh, our interview went well and blah, 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 blah. So I was probably right time, right person, right time. They didn't really have an awful lot of money. They, and they thought they had a lot of needs. So I said, well, let's, let's give it a crack for a few months and, and, and see if we both fit in. Um, 
And so I think literally about a couple of days after they offered it to me, I, I shot up to their head office in Edinburgh and I phoned Corrie, who was the chair, and I said, uh, Corrie, you, you do realise you're probably um, insolvent. I said, this is an absolute disaster at the moment. We're, uh, we really, and, and Corrie was like, oh my God, Andrew, you know, you need to help us. You need to sort this out, you know. Um, you know and I said, right, well, I don't think you can afford to pay me anything. <laughs> so, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. Let's do it for three months and see if we can turn it around. So we, uh, we closed the offices that they had offices for some reason that they clearly didn't need. And um, sadly we had to let go of some staff. Um, and I, I worked about six months for, for no remuneration. I, in fact, I lent them some bunch of cash flow for a while, um, but had incredible support from Anthony and Corey and the, and the other members of the board there. And they could see that I had a, a vision of what it, it could be. And we, we transferred it into a, from a trade body into a non-profit, an international non-profit called a community interest company. We gave it a, a new vision statement, a new brand statement. And I have to say, I probably well I did pay them to do it you know because I just loved doing it and so uh, I um, I did six months complete rebrand re new business plan new business statement that you know a whole raison d'etre at the same time went round and all the main brands had kind of left it they were down to about sixty members um, because there was no trade show anymore so there was no real reason to join. Um, went round and just sat in front of, you know, sat in front of Keith Black and said, you've got to believe in me, Keith, I'm going to get this work. And we're going to have to please rejoin. And Keith did. And sat in front of Richard Cotter at Berghaus and said, come on, Richard, you've got to believe in me. I mean, we're going to make this work. Please rejoin. And he did. So definitely pulling out some some friends and some contracts. And, and the board were incredibly supportive. The board prepaid membership for the year after to help us through the cash flow. Um, and kind of by the beginning of 2012, we... It was it was really starting to to turn around and, and look like the the beginnings of what it looks like today. It had gone from being a, a, a kind of a meaningless trade body that didn't own a trade show to a non profit with a with a clear vision of in, in brief to grow the pizza for everybody. Could could an association be made where everybody put a little bit of money in the pot. And I worked it out, it was about for every hundred pound fleece you sold, it was about a penny. Um, so a tiny bit of money in the pot that could be used for common good to grow the pie, to grow the pizza. So not that the North Face slice is bigger than the Burghaus slice, but that the whole pizza was bigger. And that could we engage with the entire outdoor recreation sector, not just the brands, not just the retailers. Could we could we talk to National Trust, the Ramblers, British Mountaineers, British Canoers, in, in the government, DCMS, you know, how could outdoor grow? Would, was there a benefit to Britain being more like Scandinavia, where a naturally healthy outdoor Britain would would in so many ways, from active commuting to, to forest schools to old age walking clubs and walking for health. Could, could we get a healthier, active Britain? Uh, you know, some of the very early research I did was that, you know, Scandinavia sells three and a half times per capita the amount of outdoor gear that we did over here. Well, you know, what could we do to make that influence? So that whole plan was really in the first three to six months um, where we, we cut all the costs out completely. We shrunk it right back and reset it. And uh, it was really, really exciting and really, really enjoyed it. So that's a three to six month turnaround project finish. And it was then at the point we did have enough members to start so paying some of those previous expenses and then start to, to, to put a little bit of money back in the pot for some consulting days. So I never, I was never employed. Uh, I was just doing day, days as and when, um, which is what enabled them obviously for, for me to do all that work without any, any costs. So it was, but come 2012, we sort of turned that round and I just thought, well, I'll just stay a little bit longer. You know, I'm quite enjoying this. And then there was the Olympics in 2012. And we just kind of, again, I think, you know, it was persistence. I, I was just down quite a lot talking to Sport England, talking to government, saying, you know, outdoors is important. No, outdoor recreation wasn't recognized as a sport. Walking wasn't recognized as a sport. Um, this is you know, pre-comp climbing, really. Um, you know, getting the, the funding and the recognition. It certainly hadn't got an Olympic recognition at the time. And so we were, lobbying's, you know, are not necessarily the right word, but, you know, I, I went from literally phoned at my local MP, said, how do you lobby with them? Again, startling naivety. You know, perhaps, perhaps that's another theme, the ability to ask the naive questions <laughs> or the willingness to be an idiot and, uh, and to get it wrong and then get it right again later. So 
we um, I just kind of started going down to London. Everything seemed to be in London. All the big businesses, all the big influences, all the big money seemed to be down in town. And so, there, and with that Olympics, I, I managed to meet Lord Coe, who I had kind of met previously through Ron Hill, so I had some connections in there. And so I leveraged that and we started to drive that. And there was a real growth in you know, with hindsight now, with a mess we're all in at the moment, you look back on the halcyon days of how amazing the energy was in 2012 when the Olympic Open Ceremony, but there was a real pro-Britain flavour. So we launched a project called Britain on Foot, which was a, uh, a project to try and get everyone behind a common goal of getting more people more active outside. It probably now the closest to that is the Get Outside campaign that we partner with the Ordnance Survey. So it was just really, really enjoyable. And it was a bit like pushing on an open door on the lobby side. So we just got involved. I got into number 10, started working with, with David Cameron and the sports minister there. There was a moment in time where something could be created that was needed. There was a gap. There was a there was a an opportunity in the market for a non-profit to grow something central for everybody. It probably just fitted my skill set, that, that persistence, that drive, that, that make, make that future goal and absolutely and utterly visualize it. How did it sound? How does it look? How does it feel? How will, it, how will you create it? And just fundamentally then backcast to creating it with an absolute certainty that it will happen. Um, it just was the right time and you know no employees on my own beaver in a way which you know I'm possibly hard to work with so it's great to just be able to do it myself um, and it just was a time and a place where what was needed and the skill set that I perhaps had just fitted well Dan and it was uh, I just really really started to enjoy it I loved the lobby inside I loved having influence and by 2015 Dave Cameron and the sports minister asked me to co-chair a, a government working group to create a national outdoor recreation strategy, which which followed by 250 million going via Sport England into um, the Sporting Futures and, uh, and and the work they did that previewed the United the Movement work, uh, the recognition of outdoor recreation for the first time in a DCMS sports strategy launched by the PM in Parliament with a bunch of grey suits and me there in a bright green mountain equipment jacket, so really bringing outdoors into the into the awareness and there isn't a there isn't a single you know i was in parliament two days ago sat next to tony blair on a big labor party thing uh, on the on the day that randall was in uh, met with the environment minister in the afternoon sports minister for lunch you know, there isn't a department that we don't work with now that isn't aware of outdoors i, I, had, a, I had a great moment uh, um you know i'd worked with cameron in the past david cameron he's obviously back now and i bumped into david cameron and they went oh outdoor guy <laughs> and he couldn't remember but you know he knew who i was he knew who we were he, i always wear brands you know preferably british brands when i'm when i'm down in parliament i don't go in the suit i try and be that that point of difference to to raise the awareness of outdoors because i absolutely utterly passionately believe that a life lived closer to nature, closer to the environment, in an active manner outdoors. In any way, and I'm not talking about climbing in the TD plus North Face, in any way outdoors is a better life and will be a, a better country for, for that. And so I just so enjoyed that side of the work. And, and at the same time, to grow the pizza, we, you know, if you remember, there was... There was OTS, there was the trade show, there was the cause show, there was the rocks show, there was the snowball, there were, there were workshops all over, there was an on tour with Salomon and another on tour with somebody else. It was so disparate, uh, dispersed after the cola show had broken up that, that we you know, made it, you know, really, again, perhaps with this passion or intensity or drive or relentlessness, I don't know, just said, but this is just daft. You know, we should be saving time, saving money, saving carbon, saving costs, saving effort. Just bloody let's get together again. We don't need to be fighting. We've got other shit to fight. So we managed to pull all that lot back together with, with OTS. And then we started to address the sustainability challenges, the climate group work that we've been doing. We've, we've recently started to address women in the industry, mentoring schemes, breaking the glass ceiling. We've done loads of work with EDI, with the Opening Up the Outdoors campaign, raised hundreds of thousands to, uh, to bring, um, to improve um, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility to everybody in the outdoors. So it, each of these areas has been so exciting and so much fun that it's, you know, it's still, you know, I was absolutely convinced I was going to retire at 40 and then I had thought about it at 50 and then I was absolutely certainly going to at 60 and, uh, and now I don't really know now. So uh, I'm just still 
I'm loving it. And there's, there's challenges to do still. So, uh, so that's the 10 year OIA uh, summary. <laughs> oh, but that's great. Well, if you still have the, the passion and the energy and the desire to do it, as you said, I think it's such an important topic, you know, to get more people outside. I think, uh, and I think your point around encouraging collaboration and driving collaboration as an industry for us is so important mm -hmm. uh, because I think the outdoor industry on its own is not a big industry if we compare it to some of the other industries mm -hmm. that are lobbying mm -hmm. uh, Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to kind of work together to to, to get the best results for the industry for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is clear. And, and that's, that's interesting you, you say that because that's always been... So the you know the the specific trade in the UK is about one and a half billion. Um, the, the the broader outdoor recreation sector, if you include campsite fees, you know hill walking, mountain guides, all this sort of stuff, it's about twenty to 22, 24 billion. So it's significant, but it's tiny compared to excuse me the GDP. Um, and so right from the beginning, we've latched onto. Um, NHS waiting lists, you know, healthy childhood, the obesity challenge, the diabetes two challenge, you know, there's, there's, there's just, I mean, I was just doing this work yesterday with, with the minister down there and we're putting together some work to try and uh, really impact the manifestos for next year and some of the shocking facts we're putting together. 25 limbs a day are amputated through diabetes 2. Diabetes 2 is costing 10 billion a year. Obesity, 98 billion the cost of the UK last year in sick days and time off in NHS. Um, you know, childhood obesity, now people are, children are leaving school at 10 or 11, 35% and the more than a third of them are now overweight or obese. Um, diabetes starting as young as eight. Um, you know, inactivity, impacting mental health, ADHD, ASD, you know, so much disassociation with nature, disassociation with physical activity outdoors. It's, it's a deep, deep fundamental challenge and problem for, for, our, for our society that we are becoming less active and less engaged with our natural environment, right down to the mitochondrial level of how our bodies and brains work, how, how they develop in utero, as, as they develop in the first three years of, of early attachment work and, and early engagement and brain development. It's, it's fundamentally vital that people are physically active outdoors, in some way, shape or form and, and not, you know, extreme skiing and all the shit that I do, but just any way at all, digging your garden, going for a walk with your dog, playing poo sticks with your kids, building campfires, anything and everything, just continuing that engagement where everyone's watched the, the Wall E movie where they are, all the beast people are floating around in the in anti-grav chairs because they've lost the ability to walk or do almost anything else. It's, it's a terrifying future and one that's, you know, genuinely, the, the, we will not solve the NHS crisis by throwing more drugs at sick people. We have got millions of people who are eating shit, sitting on sofas, doing nothing, and it's costing them their lives and this country hundreds of billions of pounds. And the simple solution to that is walk to school, get outdoors, do something. And, and if we can get that across... It addresses everything. It addresses our net zero targets by active commuting. It addresses our mental health targets. It addresses the mental, the emotional health. It addresses digital addiction. It addresses body dysmorphia in teenagers. It addresses a vast, vast host of the current modern age digital challenges that we face by simply putting down that phone, getting active outdoors in some way, shape or form. And it's, it's you know, of course, it's not the only solution. But if one, if, if you look at the 10, uh, the, the, the list of the, the happiest nations in the world by, by wellness and happiness scores that are, that are put together by the ONS here and other countries, uh, and you combine those scores and you overlay them with connections to nature and physical activity outdoors, it's no surprise that the happiest countries in the world are Norway, Denmark, Sweden, New Zealand, Finland, Iceland. These are countries that are engaged in the outdoors, active in the outdoors, still involved in the outdoors. And it's, it's absolutely, if you want to improve the wellness of, of a score of a country, then improve its physical activity outdoors and its connection to nature. It's, it is literally as simple as that. And it's almost free. It's a question of cultural change rather than financial investment. It's not another 100 billion into the NHS. It's, it's deep cultural change. And that's yeah. you know, what we want to like to, 
if I have any legacy, it, I, I wouldn't want it to be, you know, making mount equipment or, or rebranding mount equipment or whatever. It would be about making a tiny difference, perhaps, to the way we, we're mm. active outdoors in the UK. You've talked about the fact that you have lots of bikes in your garage, so I'm interested. <laughs> Favorite piece of outdoor gear, Ooh. and I know that's like probably <laughs> an impossible question, Gosh. the yeah, most difficult yeah. question of the day. I, I did, I did wonder if we were going to do like a tour of the house, and my my garage has got nine bikes hanging in it, and then next door it's got a massive ski rack with all of those, and then upstairs it looks like it's probably slightly bigger than Anthony Greensbury's shop upstairs. So uh, I've got a huge, and 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 being me, being obsessive and organised, you've got a bin for bike gear been for hardware climbing software climbing winter climbing midwear base wear everything's lined up all the fleeces first then the down then the synthetic so um so how on earth does one pick a bit of a bit of favorite gear i i am absolutely a gear addict it's terrible the only way i can possibly um justify it with uh, with the sustainability and the and and where we should be at the moment is i um I, I do buy the latest gear. I feel that I'm representing the outdoor industry sector uh, and wearing a tatty old, um, a tatty old Patagonia retro pile that I've got for 20 years old, which I still love, isn't appropriate down to Parliament, but I don't want to wear a suit. So I do wear a lot of brand new gear. I am very fortunate. I pay for everything, but I do get a bit of a pro deal account from a number of brands. Um, thank you, brands. Um, so I do try and, and wear the latest latest gear. So, from, yep, got a, another brand. There we are, Terex and uh, Black Diamond, Mountain Equipment, Salomon. So a good selection of my members' gear on. Um, but uh, now, consequently, I constantly churn an eBay and all the stuff out, and I never put reserve price on. So I do. So I'm. If, you, if you're six two and, a, and an American medium or a men's large or a British large, then uh, then then watch my eBay site because there's loads of great deals, and I never put reserve on it. And 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 joking apart, I love the idea that there are people out there, you know, students or, or people that perhaps not got such a disposable income that are, are now getting great deals and they're getting out active on the hill with some decent gear. So uh, so I, I'm I'm sorry to say I've got too much gear and I should but there we are, I have my favorite bit of it then when you said that I'm a great believer in that old coin toss trick you know whether it's the right answer or not what's the first thing that pops into your head because it often gives you an indication and then you can review it and I've got a set of um, Salomon MTN 95s they're touring ski and I mounted them with the um, so not the Dinafit binding, although obviously it's got to be a tech binding for me, but the um, the um, ATK binding, the Italian people that make the ultralight version, the race version, which is only 120 grams, and it's in anodized blue, so it fits the uh, the color scheme. So I think the Salomon uh, in 95, it skis almost as well as an Alpine ski, um, but it's really light. It's light enough, um, not quite as light as a race ski mo ski, but to go uphill. Um, so, and with that matching anonized blue binding on the whole package is, is beautiful. It goes up here with, I, I'm fortunate to be moderately fit compared to other people my age that ski tour with. So I, I've never really have a problem going uphill in, in the pack in regards to how heavy my kit is. So a little bit more weight, which gives me the control to, to ski steep stuff on the way down. So I think if I had to choose and, and I often, people often say, cause I kind of, I love outdoor sports. I, I, I've climbed bunch of North Faces, bunch of big walls in the States, uh, first ascents in, I've been climbed on all seven continents, I've been very fortunate, done first ascents in, in many of them, um, punter level, never nothing difficult, but I've done a few of the classic North Faces, done you know, half them in El Cap, so I've done some punter good stuff, um, and people sort of say, but then, uh, you know, mountain bike across the Sahara, done a bunch of big mountain bike crossings, bunch of ski crossings, ski Antarctica, the Arctic. And people say, well, what would you do? What's the last sport you do? You know, is it Ironman or is it ski touring? And I think of all the outdoor stuff, I've got my Parapont license. I love them all. I can't, I couldn't possibly choose. It would be impossible to choose a bit of kit or a sport. But if I absolutely had to choose only one at the end, what's that desert island disc, you know, yeah. then I think it would be ski mountaineering, you know, tough ski touring, technical ascents, alpine ascents, bringing you know either hauling or carrying your skis and then you know difficult descents involving challenging steep skiing repelling exploration in in really really remote areas with first sense that's that's my the one i'd give up last of all of the sports and activities and so my favorite bit of gear would have to be something that would facilitate that so my salomon and 95 touring skis with my uh, 80k bindings on
What book would you advise somebody to read who wanted to have a successful career within the sports and outdoor industry? Oh, golly gosh, that's interesting. That's interesting. But if, if I had to get a book, I, th I think a technical book, it's very simplistic. But sometimes one forgets if one's been in the industry and one's read everything for 30, 40 years, sometimes they forget that the simple stuff is still great stuff if you haven't read it. So you can do a lot worse than Kobe. You know, it's a, a cracking first effort into... And, and again, this you can overcomplicate this stuff. You can do a four-year MBA at Harvard in business, but the fundamentals are still the fundamentals. So I think you can do an awful lot worse than COVID um, than Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Um, sometimes it's fun to read the stories, you know, just do it, the story of Nike, the men and boys that played and run her, you know, some of the great stories, the... the um, Isaac, what's his face? The Apple story, Steve Jobs' story. Yeah, Walter Isaacson's. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I love all of those. I think if I were to, to simple, simply choose one, it would probably probably be the Kobe one because it's a really clean and simple starting point. Um, but there's loads, the E-Myth, the entrepreneurs. There's there's so many great things out there. I, I've got a, and I love reading, absolutely love reading. Every night, I never, ever, no matter what time I've got in, well, bivouac, what I've, I've read in ice caves, I've read on portal ledges, I've read on boats. I just read, read, and then I can't read, I'm listening to, listening to podcasts. So there's so much out there, it's, it's, it's fabulous. What's the most valuable piece of advice you've ever received? I'm gonna retire, and beyond that, actually, I'm gonna completely step away from the outdoor industry. Yeah. What would be your last message to the industry? Something along the lines of don't forget you're so much more than just flogging shit. <laughs> that it isn't about the lay pattern for this fleece, you know, or the you know the, the, the shell and the insulation and the mid and the basin and all of the technical stuff and getting up Everest and all of that. Of course, it is there, but. The, the Norwegians have got this lovely expression of, of, of air like luft left laugh, so air, air something something. Um, must must drop that in later, but it's this it's this deep expression of a connectedness to to life and the outdoors and the environment and nature, and the outdoor industry is the closest we've got to an industry that can express an ownership or a stewardship or a promotional bringing together of that benefit that we we know the challenge we face on on the climate crisis at the moment we know the challenge we face on biodiversity we know the challenge we face on physical activity on mental health and emotional health in a digital world the enormous challenges we're facing at the moment and if there's one thing that can pull that together, I think it's that being physically active outdoors. And consequently, our industry have an, an inalienable necessity to promote the, the, the bigger picture of what our industry can stand for. That you, the thing that, particularly in this country, you need a pair of boots and a, something to keep you dry you know it isn't the gear it's what the gear facilitates you to do and then in the doing of that how much broader your perception of life your value chain everything from how you interact with your friends and your family and your the, where when you get to that moment hopefully for me skiing a black run when i'm 99 years old but whatever point you get to that moment and you look back at a, at a great life then it won't be about the meetings you went to or the money you made or the EBITDA. It will be about the bigger things. And the outdoor industry has that opportunity to see those. We, yeah, I've, I've, yeah, I've climbed some epic, you know, 24 hours plus on big alpine north faces, huge polar pools, absolutely exhausted. And you don't give up two hoots about anything about can i breathe can i drink is there any food left will i be uh, will i survive tonight through, without frostbite it's so deeply deeply fundamental there's no room for bullshit it's utterly authentic and that authenticity that cutting through the crap is where our industry perhaps it's its greatest legacy and, and its greatest message. And so I would just say if I left that, sounds awfully pompous, doesn't no one want to hear what I've got to say. But if, if you did ask me to leave that message, it would be that don't forget we're greater than just the stuff we make. It's the 
message and the value that underlies our industry. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's not pompous at all. I think it's very inspiring. So, so last question. So the, the goal of this, uh, this interview, or let's say the sports and outdoor mentors platform is to hopefully help people to benefit from experiences of people like yourself, um, in their career path. So if you, could share three pieces of advice for anybody that maybe is already in the sports and outdoor industry, is a, is a leader or wants to become a leader within the industry. What would those three pieces of advice be? Well, certainly the first one would be stick at it. It's a, uh, it's a brilliant industry. I do, I do remember um, many years ago, someone who, who worked in the at Rohan, um, we were talking about it 40 years ago. And he just said something about like, uh, hey, oh, I'm not going to stay in this industry. There's no money in this industry. You know, it's just a rinky dink full of enthusiasts and, and uh, you know, amateurs. And uh, it kind of got my back up at the time, to be frank. And I just thought, well, I think I can make money in this industry. <laughs> and and I haven't made as much as some, but I made enough. I'm very happy. And and more importantly, that balance that we talked about earlier, you know, as long as you've got food on the table and, and you're happy. Um, so it's absolutely worth staying in. I think not only because it's a fabulous industry full of fabulous people and, and, it, and it sells more than just stuff, it's worth doing it. You, you can make money. You can be very successful in it. You can, you can absolutely, you can, you can make a multi-million pound businesses. You know, we, we've not touched on that, you know, I'm in business with uh, John Dunn, the climber. And for 20 years now, we've got a fabulous series of six climbing walls. That are, it's a great business that, that we've still got going that John runs fantastically as well as my other businesses in the past. So it's, it isn't necessarily the easiest business in the world, but you know, nobody told Phil Knight it would be easy, but what are they doing now? 36 billion, you know? So, so yes, do it. Don't be dispirited. It might not appear to be as easy initially. And, and there are an awful lot of difficult jobs to start off. If you're watching this and you're working on the shop floor in a, in, in a JD Outdoors, then uh, it might seem a million miles away. But, um, but it's really worth sticking at it. I think it's a lot of fun. It's a fabulous industry to be in. So that's certainly one of them. I don't know. I think, I think balance, perhaps, if we're coming up with another one, don't forget why you got into the industry. I, I see people now who I used to run with or climb with who, who don't anymore and, and, you know, don't lose track, don't get, you know, I'm one to say, don't get obsessed with stuff. Don't get, you know, so into, into the business side of it. That's all that you do it for. We do it for more than that. And I, I, whatever it is, whether it's climbing a North Face or parapointing off the top of something steep in Chamonix, you know, or, or just doing part run, but whatever your thing is, don't forget you got into the sports or outdoor because you probably loved sport or outdoor. So uh, try and run the two side by side. So stay in it, persist in it, you can succeed in it. But don't forget that you, you, you love the other. And then, and then perhaps in, I think, I think there's a huge part of our, our life that is, uh, that is our work and how we make our money, how one pays the mortgage and, and pays the bills and facilitates what you want to do with your life. And then there is that part that is your, your sport or your physical activity or your, or your passions. Um, but perhaps the third one is, is family and, and, and your friends and your social life. And maybe there's a, a lovely fit and only because you asked me three, you've asked me four and I'm sure I've found a fourth, but it feels like they're the three core things in your life maybe. And so we're back to balance. We're back to my, my yoga training that, that you have to make the money. Don't forget to enjoy why you're making the money. And, but don't, I, and when I was training for Ironman World Championships, doing like 25, 30 hours a, a week, and my wife never saw me, that was probably a bit overboard on that side. When I was building mountain equipment, working 70, 80, 90 hours a week, and uh, divorced in my first marriage, that uh, was probably overboard on that side of it. Um, now I've got Dora, and uh, I'm, I'm fortunate that I've got a broader portfolio that I can balance. I, I love being able to play piano with in the morning, take her to school. So for me, Perhaps we're come with back round to balance and perhaps, yes, it's a fabulous industry. Stay in it. Don't forget why you started in it, but don't forget whatever you do, that your family and your friends and your mental and your emotional balance is absolutely as important as those other two. So is that three things? Well, I don't know if it is, but it's a perfect way to finish because I think it's, uh, yeah, it's super important. And if you don't do that, then the other things I would say become pretty difficult to do. So. Yeah. 
Brilliant. Well, look, Andrew, we could have talked for much more because there are some things we only scratched the surface on, which I would have loved to go more deeper, but we're already a little bit over time. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for sharing. It's incredibly inspiring. And, you know, as somebody who initially worked within the UK outdoor industry and now, let's say, works more from a European perspective, you know, what you've been able to achieve at the IA is is amazing so you know keep up the amazing work um i think i can speak on behalf of the industry that uh yeah i think we're all you know really happy to have oh, you yeah, here yeah it's absolutely so. a team you know i've got an incredible board of volunteer directors who are just brilliant who give me their their time you know completely and then the team at mcs doing the background so i'm just like the the guy that shuffles all the pieces on the on the deck chairs but uh on the on the deck but uh yeah do love it and and you know to the industry is watching many thanks for all your support you know we'll keep doing what we can and thank you dan it's been a really enjoyable thoroughly enjoyed the uh, the meeting cheers thanks andrew take care i hope you enjoyed the episode as much as i did we love to read your feedback so please leave your thoughts in the comments below thanks again for your support see you soon and don't forget to subscribe